Okay. So our second talk would be presented by Adrian McCullough. Uh, Adrian has a, uh, degrees in computer science and law, as well as PhD in IT security. He obtained his PhD from the Information Security Research Center here at QUT. He is a member of the Queensland Law Society and a member of the American Bar Associations. Adrian is a member of the Australian Law Council Digital Commerce Committee, a member of the Queensland Law Society Digital Privacy Committee, and the Queensland Law Society IT Law Committee, um, Committee and is a special advisor um, to the Director General of the Blockchain Climate Institution, that is an NGO partial, particular, partially founded by the UN and the UK government. So your talk will be. Is it why do we need? No. I mean, did you put it? Oh, I don't know. Is that about the UK's lawyer? No, it's not. No, it's really big enough. Yeah. I think, yeah, there we go. You, I think you have the both the PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint or um, PowerPoint? Or yeah, yeah. PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay, yes, then I have to. Uh, The screen. Oh, you just have to push the button. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it cherry? Yeah. Um, I am a practicing attorney. This is my disclaimer. Everything I say could be bullshit. Okay. We all know what a lawyer is. It's misspelling of a liar. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is give you a quick introduction, um, looking at uh, traditional contract drafting, understanding the difference as lawyers, um, we get trained in um, non-deterministic language, and we may need to change our drafting styles to deterministic. I look at a couple of boilerplate clauses that could be utilized in smart contracts, and also um, I look at pseudocode as a new skill for lawyers. And um, just as a joke, I picked up um, uh, some pseudocode from Professor Donald Muth, uh, very famous um, uh, academic, uh, computer scientist from Stanford University. Um, look, there's a lot of hype around smart. Oh, there is actually a paper which uh, Peter has, and he's going to distribute it yeah, to everyone. You've got a few papers. Okay, look, there's a real lot of hype about um, smart contracts. Personally, um, they're not a contract and they're not smart, okay? Very simple. Um, what they really are is transaction event monitoring code. You need an event, you need a transaction, you need a transaction to start off with, right? Then you need some sort of event to trigger something and there will be a response that gets written to um, the blockchain. And we can see that with what happened with the Dow debacle in 2016. And there's a whole heap of um, aspects where people have said that code is law. That originates from um, Lawrence Lessig's book. Um, but uh, look, code is not law, okay? You can't contract out of the court's jurisdiction. And as we found out with the, the Dow debacle, um, there had to be a hard fork. And the thing in 2016, Ethereum had only been around for about 12 months at that point in time. Um, they didn't want there to be a, an issue of approximately $50 million in value um, siphoned off the, uh, the Gent brothers' uh, Dow code. So they really had no option. Otherwise, there would have been a total market failure and, and trust inside the Ethereum uh, blockchain. So let's look at some... Um, drafting skills. This is the way lawyers get taught, right? We, are, we have to ask five questions. Who, what, when, where, how? Okay, it's very simple. Who's going to do it? What are they going to do? When are they going to do it by? And sometimes where and how become very important in the transaction. So an example of that is the lessee may pay 
must pay rent to the landlord by no later than the 15th day of each month in clear funds into the designated bank account. Very simple, it's just part of the lease. It tells you who's going to do it, the lessee. What are they going to do? They're going to pay the rent. When are they going to do it by? The 15th of each month. Very simple. This one also goes on and talks about how. Clear funds into the designated bank account. Very simple. But then we go on and we say, well, we have a standard approach. The thing about all contracts is that they will run on basically two types of statements, absolute statements and logic statements. Simple as that. Um, and if then else, right? Which is the same as the way computer programs work. All computer programs just work on an absolute statement. I'm going to declare an integer or I'm going to set the integer to zero or I'm going to have some sort of logic statement, whether it's a where statement, an in case statement, an if then else statement, even you know, a, a, a loop is still a combination of logic arrangements until such time as the loop meets its final condition. So let's look at this one. It says the contract door must attend the principal's office on a daily basis during business hours to provide the service. Whilst the contract door is located at the principal's office, the contract door must follow all reasonable instructions issued by the principal's representative. The first one in paragraph A is an absolute statement. What's got it done? Contractor has to attend the principal's office during business hours. We meet all the requirements of who, what, when, and also where. The second one is a logical statement. Whilst he's there, he's got to follow reasonable legal instructions. But how would a computer deal with statements such as reasonable legal instructions? That is non-deterministic language. The term reasonable, at first sight, appears immensely vague and thus uncertain. Now, the law interprets these vague this vague terminology by applying what's called the reasonable person test. Um, that is, how would a reasonable, disassociated, independent person regard the instruction? And that's the way the courts look at these things. They look at the reasonable person's test. Um, with all due respect to the ladies here, there's a very famous judge called Lord Denning, and he got in a hell of a lot of trouble in a particular case where he said, there's no such thing as a reasonable woman, it has to be a reasonable man. Um, about four months later, he had to retire from the House of Lords. So um, there's a reason for that too. Okay, the reasonable person test um, is an objective test that is theoretically applied by an independent reasonable person of the general public. Um, note that the test does away or attempts to do away with bias since it's an objective test, not a subjective test. Um, but note, this is a post-interpretive test. It's only applied after the contract has been formed and set against the actions of the parties. Here's another example. The lessee must, within a reasonable time, after being notified by the landlord that the lessee is in default of the terms of lease, rectify such notified default. Again, how will, will how would a smart legal contract deal with reasonable time? Well, it might have um, connection to an AI machine that goes out and checks all of the uh, uh, cases dealing with reasonable time on similar facts and comes back with a period of time. The problem with that is going to be really slow and expensive. So what we really want to look at is how do, do lawyers change their drafting styles? Now, lawyers are generally draft clauses. Um, they'll not know at the time of entering the contract all of the possible defaults. For example, non-payment can be corrected in a very short period of time, whereas a building fault may take time because it's got to rely on the availability of external workers. So you can do what are called um, multiple solution clauses, but clients don't like multiple solution clauses. Why? Because they become complex and they think lawyers are milking their client because we're now producing something that probably could have been done in six, seven pages, suddenly becomes 20, 25 pages. 
So the moment you start building in complexity, so does the length of the agreement and clients get pissed off at us at that, okay? So we try to um, uh, reduce that immensely. So what we wanna do is we wanna look at the difference between deterministic and non-deterministic language. A deterministic algorithm basically provides, given a particular input, will always produce the same output, ensuring that the computer goes through the same process states to reach the result. That comes out of Newt's book on fundamental algorithm. In the case of a non-deterministic algorithm, for the same input, the algorithm may produce different output on different runs. That's non-deterministic. So computers do not generally like non-deterministic logic. The same input should produce the same output. So traditional contracts, as they are interpreted, should be self-contained. Courts don't like going to um, external aspects of a contract. They want to read the contract and say, aha, I know who's got to do what. Was it done? No. Here's the evidence to support that it wasn't done. So one of the parties is in default. Um, that won't occur in many respects if we have smart legal contracts in place. Because smart legal contracts are, uh, co uh, uh, is code that will be developed based upon a pre-existing traditional contract, like a lease or a mortgage um, that was explained uh, by, um, I've forgotten the gentleman's name, the previous speaker, uh, Alex. So the next thing that comes about is that um, we have in draft, when we get taught drafting, we have what are called boilerplate clauses, which are clauses basically that are tagged on to the end of most um, agreements. Um, unfortunately, willy nilly, a lot of people, a lot of lawyers don't even read them properly and then adjust them to make sure that they actually fit the circumstances of the case. So you might have an, an entire agreement clause. So an entire agreement clause says, this agreement comprises the terms and conditions detailed in the document and also incorporates the operations of the smart legal contract. That's important because if you usually look at a smart, at an entire agreement clause, it says um, everything that's been done or negotiated beforehand is excluded. And if it's not in here, don't worry about it. Now, the courts can look at external um, aspects if the contract is vague and they need to go to third party documents to identify what the hell are these parties actually talking to. And if they still can't do that, then it might be void for uncertainty. And there's a very famous case of the United Kingdom called Scammell and Easton dealing with the description of a truck. Now, if there is a discrepancy, then you need, if you're gonna have an entire agreements clause, you've already incorporated the code of the smart legal contract. And you would define what we mean by the smart legal contract. Now, if there is a discrepancy between the terms and conditions of this document and the operations of the smart legal contract, then and you have to work out which one's gonna take precedence, okay? Because if, and frankly, if you really, if, if a court comes involved in this, make sure it's the um, terms and conditions of the document so the court can identify uh, exactly what was meant in natural language, because then you're gonna to have to have the poor court, as I say, the poor schmuck who has to design this or decide the uh, decision, what the hell does the smart legal contract actually do? Does it correspond to what the parties have actually agreed to in a natural language? You know, in the mortgage, what are the defaults of the mortgage? Um, in the lease. So the parties um, should delete whichever um, has not been agreed to, though it is suggested the natural language um, should take precedence. Now, we know that um, a blockchain is a distributed ledger, which means that there's going to be multiple nodes, multiple replications of exactly the same thing, which means that the smart legal contract code is going to be replicated across the entire blockchains, replication of the blockchains. Those um, uh, replications could be in multiple jurisdictions. You really need to make sure uh, that in the smart legal contract uh, code 
should be distributed and captured at each of the nodes involved in the room. The various nodes may reside across, so consequently, a government law, governing law clause is imperial. What that means is that if you're on the Ethereum, I don't know how many nodes there are, 6,000, 10,000, whatever nodes on the Ethereum, probably across 100 jurisdictions now, maybe more, maybe less, I don't know, um, you need a governing law clause to say, irrespective of where the code may reside, it will be interpreted in Australia or the United States or UK, whichever jurisdiction that you want. You might even want to rely upon the International Chamber of Commerce out of Paris as an independent um, uh, environment. Then you've got a conflicts of language clause. Um, what is to occur if there's a conflict between the natural language version of the contract and the smart legal contract code? Now, I said earlier in my entire agreements clause that the natural language should take precedent, but you might not want that. You might want to um, rely upon the smart legal contract if you so desire. Um, now, it's recommended that the natural language version should have a precedence clause. Uh, this will assist the court um, if such a situation arises as uh, the court is expected to determine which version has precedence. This has been covered in the entire agreement clause. The other thing that you really need to know, there's, there's a high court decision in this country called Bacalo, Bacalo, B-A-U-C-L-A-U-C, I think it is. And, and just as Isaacs, um, it's a fairly old case, um, basically explained why you can't oust the court's jurisdiction. Now, there are arbitration clauses, uh, which are called Scott Mabry clauses, but they don't oust the court's jurisdiction. They just put a precedence before you can go to court that you have to have an arbitration determination. Um, but you cannot oust the court's jurisdiction. So that's why the code is not law. Okay, Court will always have final jurisdiction over this. Your difficulty is going to, how are you going to teach the judges to understand what's before them? Now, that's not impossible. There's been heaps of very, very complex patent cases especially in the biotechnology environment, where the judges have had a number of experts, um, plaintiff's experts, the uh, defense experts, and they may actually call in what's called a friend of the court, uh, an amicus curiae, for instance, as they're called. Um, and they may get their own independent uh, uh, expert to help them understand what the two conflicting experts are saying. Okay, so it becomes a very complex issue. So variations, here's the real problem right now. I don't want to upset consensus because I know that they're in Ethereum um, shop, but I think that uh, Vitalik made a major mistake in having the smart legal contract code embodied in a block. Because if it's in a block, it becomes immutable. If it becomes immutable, you can't change it, right? And I don't know too many contracts, especially long-term contracts, what are called longitudinal contracts, that you don't have a variations clause, right? People like to vary. Um, I was doing one uh, quite recently, helping a client, not a, not a blockchain, but just a general agreement and both sides, after six months, realized that there were aspects of the contract that just weren't working for either of them. So they renegotiated and did a deed of variation over it. I don't know how you're going to do that if you have immutability. The other aspect is, is that, remember, the smart legal contract is processing. It's a, an event response code. You have all these transactions. By the time you realize that the code is not working for you, You've got a whole heap of transactions that have already been written to the blockchain on the appendix aspect. How do you deal with that? And that was the whole point of the DAO. They had to go back prior to the block where they started and did the hard fork. So you've got these issues. Now, you might want to, in just a suggestion, you might want to have a kill switch inside your code. Kill switch could be, I'm going to go look at this directory. And if it's a one, I'm going to continue processing. If it's a zero, 
I'm going to stop, okay, and allow people to process why have we changed. And then you have to work out who has the right to change the one to the zero on the outside directory. Do you need a court order for that? Then you've got what happens if you get a court order? Or sorry, you both agree, say, we're not certain about this. Why don't we kill it? Go to court, get a declaration. And the court says, oh, I understand this. This is pretty simple. Um, now you've got to restart it. And then you've got to have a restart mechanism inside your smart legal contract, a reactivation code. So, you know, there's, there's a whole heap of issues with smart legal contracts um, that remain um, outstanding in all of this. And I don't know the answers to all of these. These are just things that I've identified. Now, parties may want to agree up front if there, um, is a dis that if there is a dispute, um, then the court can and should be encouraged to call upon, I've already spoken about this, this is dealing with friends at Dynamicus Curi. Here's the next one, oracles. Um, they were first proposed in 2000, late 2015, if I remember correctly, oracles. Now, the parties may wish to address the issue of the role of oracles and under what circumstances the information provided by an oracle will impact the operations of the smart legal contract code. Now, you know, an oracle could be um, you are going to pay um, a mortgage off, but unfortunately the telecommunicate, some idiot has um, uh, dug a hole, broken the communications line, and therefore, even though you wanted to meet the obligations of the smart legal contract, you couldn't, okay? You got Cyclone Larry coming through, wiping out the whole of the telecommunications lines in North Queensland. You might want to rely upon the Bureau of Meteorology, or if you're in, if you're in San Francisco, maybe the um, Department of Geosciences in case there's an earthquake that's destroyed half of uh, San Francisco and LA and the rest of California. So the drafter should um, ensure that the parties understand um, who the accepted oracles are, what they can do, and when they can do it in relation to your smart legal contract. So you've got these outstanding issues. Remember what I said, courts like self-contained traditional contracts. Now you've got this third party sitting out there who says, I can stop this because I'm the Bureau of Meteorology, I'm the Oracle, and I'm sending a piece of information that says, um, this is not a breach of contract. It's a part of a force majeure clause. We also have um, the uh, doctrine of frustration, which um, there's a very famous case in Australia um, called Cadelfa's case. Basically, um, Cadelfa, Cadelfa against New South Wales Rail, there was a contract to build a tunnel for uh, a railway. Uh, they were based on all of the pricing of 24-hour um, drilling. Unfortunately, the drilling was creating a problem for the people who are living on the surface of the land. They got an injunction that says that Cadelfa could no longer um, run their drilling equipment from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. That lost a third of the day that they previously had. Uh, Cadelfa went to New South Wales Rail Authority and said, um, you need to extend our contract and funding. New South Wales Rail said no. Went to the High Court and said, well, this, is, this contract has been frustrated. Much to the upsetness of um, New South Wales Rail, because suddenly the revised contract that they had to renegotiate was something like 2.5 times the original contract, and it went for a lot longer. So Cadelfa won that case. So if, if an oracle determines that a force majeure event has occurred, then the operations of the smart legal contract can be suspended pending reactivation. And this will involve a good faith and cooperation clause to restart the smart legal. What I'm trying to get at here is that you've got these contracts, traditional contracts. If they're going to be converted into some form of smart legal contract in code onto a blockchain, you need to at least address some issues inside your traditional contract so that they are accounted for 
so that when a court comes along, they say, I understand what this is all about, right? Now, they may also ask for um, an amicus curiae as well, or they might say, do the parties agree that these are the right provisions? Yes, then here's my determination. Pseudocode. Look, I've got a computer science degree. I gave up coding 33 years ago. I would be the worst bloody coder in this room. Totally. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. There's someone who's disputing me. <laughs> Look, I only, ever, I only ever wrote one error-free program. It was print A, and guess what? It printed A. Um, so the moment you start putting in complexity, you get problems. Now, I wouldn't trust a lawyer to write code. Any lawyer, to be honest. They're there to under, even though we go through a lot of the same processes, we have a problem. We break the problem down into sub problems. And we, we write contracts against each sub problem so that we get a solution. When I got taught coding, and I graduated in 1979, um, we was, here's a problem, broke it down into sub problems, write your modules, link them all together, and run the bloody thing. And hopefully, you haven't got any typo errors in there, you've met the requirements of the compiler, and suddenly it runs, okay? Not always, trust me. The worst thing that ever happened to me was in my um, honors project. I, and this is long before you guys, I mean, we had cards. I had two boxes, 5,000 cards. I dropped them. According to the um, uh, computer center manager, he could hear me at the other end in his office and he ran and he thought someone had died. And then he went mad at me for yelling so loud. Um, so what I'm looking at is we need to, we don't want lawyers to write this code. They will stuff it up big time. And I've got computer science degree and I'd stuff it up big time. You've got people who know how to write traditional contract, whether it's a lease, a mortgage, any type of longitudinal contract. And the whole point of having smart legal contracts is to reduce the um, contract administration costs. That's their benefit, really, to reduce contract administration costs to monitor. Because instead of having someone at, at a desk in a bank saying, well, and I know this, that they, all, they have automated all this stuff. So, you know, in the old days, they'd have someone looking and saying, has there been a deposit against this account? Yes. Good. Well, now you can automate all of that. And now you've got this immutable record with the blockchain that is really evidentially based, which is really good. I'm suggesting that lawyers need to be trained in an intermediary step. And that is, they need to understand how to write pseudocode, okay? So the step being the production of pseudocode that will correspond to the terms detailed in the natural language contract. The benefit of this intermediary step is that it will create a feedback loop for lawyers, thought process, which should identify any faults in the logic of the contract. The whole point of this is, look, I've written heaps of, con luckily, I've never had any of my contracts um, end up before a judge. I'm sure that I have written bullshit contracts that don't make sense if you really analyze them right down to the nth degree. I'm positive of that, okay? Because the moment you start putting in complexity, humans have this frailty of overlooking them, overlooking the faults. If you put in this pseudocode step, I think you'll get a feedback loop that you'll get better contracts in the long run for the contract administration perspective. But um, it should result in tighter contractual obligations and thus be a more efficient process, especially from a contract management perspective. Now, what do we mean by pseudocode? Well, pseudocode is an informal way to express the design of a computer program or algorithm. So it's an informal, it's a, it's a natural language. It's like saying, um, when I went through that, you probably, anybody here heard of Nazi Schneiderman charts? You have. It was two Germans 
who worked out and said, flowcharts are a load of crap. We're going to now logically structure these things in different types of boxes. And it was actually a, a, a well-designed um, system. Um, it just didn't catch on. It was too, too efficient, I think, for um, coders. So in computer science, an algorithm is a well-defined set of rules that specifies a series of elementary operations to be applied to some data known as the input so as to be a finite time some output. So the aim of pseudocode, this is, we, we need to teach these two lawyers, but they also need to be understood by the coder because what's gonna happen, it's like a, um, a conveyor belt. I've written this contract, I've now done some pseudocode, I've corrected my other contract, I've now got the pseudocode, I'm now gonna pass it over to someone who knows how to read this type of this type of pseudocode so that I get a proper smart legal contract, okay? So pseudocode often uses structural conventions um, of a normal program, but is intended for human reading rather than machine reading. This is Donald Knuth's How to Read His Book. It's on page one of, it. does everyone, you all know who Donald Muth is, don't you? Fundamental algorithm. He's he he wrote seven or uh, six volumes um, on from Stanford University. Each one is nearly a thousand pages. You know, sorting and searching. Um, fundamental algorithm. So this is how to read his book. Begin reading this procedure unless you've already begun reading. Um, continue safely. Read the note for the exercises. Set n equal to one. Begin reading chapter n. Do not read the quotations that appear at the beginning of the chapter. Why? Because they're just quotations, little anecdotes that he's put at the beginning of each of his chapters. Is the subject matter of the chapter interesting to you? If so, go to seven. If not, go to six. So if it's six, it says, is n less than or equal to two? If not, go to six. If not, go to sixteen. Um, if so, scan through the chapter anyway. Begin reading the next chapter, uh, the next section of the chapter. If you already have reached the end of the chapter, then go to sixteen. Increase n by one. If n equals three, five, seven, nine, eleven, or twelve, then you need to go to a different book. Interestingly, um, he's also got, he, he, you, you notice that I jumped from seven to 16. One of the steps is, um, if it's late at night, go to bed, wake up the next morning and go to item seven. Item seven is begin reading the next section, okay? So what, he's, what, he, what I'm trying to get at is that's the type of pseudocode, nice natural language that's logical, and can be converted into some sort of computer program. So um, training the next generation of contract lawyers should include the upskilling of these lawyers to understand the difference between deterministic language and non-deterministic language. Very important. Don't use, if you can identify specific timeframes or specific aspects, put them in your contract. If you know it's gonna be converted to a smart legal contract, you don't wanna use reasonable time and things of that nature. Lawyers need to understand the impact of smart legal contracts on their traditional contracts. And as such, special boilerplate causes should be considered. Just the ones, there's a whole heap of them, right? I just picked out some that I thought might be of interest. Now, some lawyers should be provided with sufficient skills to develop pseudocode, um, which can be utilized by a skilled smart legal contract coder to develop the corresponding smart legal contract, which can be deployed on the blockchain. And that's it. I did it in half an hour. God, I'm good. And I'm very modest. Do we have time for, yes, I thought we were going to get one for you. Just turn my phone off. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you, you're not going to have 
and there, there's something that I didn't agree with with what Alex because he had wills down there. Um, wills are a set of procedure, but they're statutorily framed. Okay, um, I would I, I wouldn't call them a smart legal a smart contract. Okay, they're just a piece of code that follows the legislative requirements on is there a will in place? If not then there's intestate. What are the rules of intestate? And you follow that process. Um, but yeah, I, I, you wouldn't get a smart contract sitting by itself. Like I'm a member of the ISO um, Technical Committee 307 that's looking at blockchain standards. And I'm in working group three, which is dealing with um, smart contracts. Now, there are some people in the group who are very hard to um, deal with uh, that believe that you can have a legal smart contract. I don't think that's correct. I think you'll have a smart legal contract. And I know as Alex is listening in and he's just come on. So what, what, and I, 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 the only disagreement I had with you was wills. Okay. Everything else I had no problem with, but wills are not. Um, they're a statutory framework that you're following not a contractual arrangement between two or more people. Um, look, uh, yeah, I, I do agree with most of the things that you mentioned. And I, I myself know how is it important to lawyers uh, start dealing with all these things with, with computer science. And I understand um, uh, all these digital things. Uh, I myself been uh, sort of sitting on on two chairs, uh, being a lawyer and software engineer. I I, I know how how is it important. And what I'm trying uh, would like to say is that it's so uh, a widespread fallacy among the legal community, unfortunately, that uh, that uh, immutability of the ledger impedes the use of uh, uh, smart legal contracts. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that. The, when, when you encounter these kind of complications with having a uh, uh, sort of that end situation with, with the smart contract, it just means the smart contract is not properly designed. It, it, it must be properly designed to work around the mutable ledger. So, I mean, the simple question, uh, what do you do in the real life with, with contract? Uh, you, you don't rewrite the you don't rewrite history. So you don't want to rewrite the ledger as well. So when legal circumstances change, the only thing you need to, you know, or the, the smart contract must be able to is to accommodate changes, to amend uh, something uh, or to, to add a new transaction. And so why, uh, why blockchain or ledger actually, this kind of ledger, uh, is, is good for legal relationship is that when we have uh, these strict order of blocks, so you cannot actually to change the order, the, cro the chronology of blocks, uh, you basically, what you need is to refer to the latest record on blockchain that states or the, the, the shows the current states, uh, the current state of affairs. So, what I'm trying to say is that blockchain is just a repository, public repository uh, of everything that happened in the real world. If if something happened with uh, uh, with with legal relationships within the smart contract smart contract relationships, you don't change the history. You just amend. You just create a new transaction. That's that's the whole uh, point of of running legal smart contracts. I hope that this helps. Actually, uh, I have a, um, a YouTube channel, uh, Blockchain State, and my latest uh, video on, on this uh, channel explains the idea of, of blockchain jurisdictions is actually what I'm uh, explaining um, right now. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, the, yeah, the other thing about all this is that when it, if, if you're going to have a dispute, and you've got a, uh, you've got a, a court, um, 
you now have an issue of evidence. Now, it's arguable that the, we have an Evidence Act in Queensland, which doesn't match the New South Wales or the Federal. Uh, Federal Evidence Act um, is completely different to um, Australia, uh, to, to Queensland, that is. And under Section 95 of our Act, um, Here's an interesting thing. Under Section 95, um, you have this issue that uh, a, pers a responsible person has the obligation to sign a declaration that the system was working in accordance with the specifications in order to get it into evidence. How are you going to do that with a blockchain when you've got multiple units out there that are outside? You're not going to have a responsible person. Now, there's an old case. It's called um, uh, SO against Southport Corporation. The reason I know these things is because I did my honours thesis um, on the admissibility of computer-generated evidence in Australia. And the vast majority of, even though that's a 34-year-old thesis, the vast majority of the crap I wrote is still in existence. They haven't advanced in very much of it. Um, and I read that thesis recently and it's terribly written. Um, now, one of the things is um, Southport Corporation was dealing with um, uh, an oil tanker that ran into um, the pier, one of the piers. And they were claiming negligence and they were relying upon the radar evidence of the actual SO um, tanker. And the court said, and literally, SO was actually going against their own radar. They said, no, no, you have to prove that that radar is, is working. And the court said, no, they don't. Radar had been around for over 25 years at that point. I, mean, I think radar was invented in 1942, somewhere around about that time, 1941, somewhere around that, that time during the war. Um, this is a 1967 case. Um, the court said, no, radar has been around for such a long period now that it's now regarded as a scientific instrument. Those type of arguments were also raised on breathalyzer tests as well, that there were a lot of challenges on the admissibility of breathalyzer evidence. And now breathalyzers are regarded as being um, scientific instruments. So therefore, there's a reversal of the onus of proof. You want to challenge it? You've got to show that that particular breathalyzer wasn't working correctly. And the court and um, ESO had to show that their radar wasn't working properly and they couldn't do that. Now, when we come to blockchain, you've got a real problem there. I don't think you'll ever get blockchain regarded as a scientific instrument. You're always going to have this issue of having to prove something. And now you've got the problem that because of the multiple replications of this repository, how are you going to prove that they're all the same? I'm not saying it's out of the question. I think court may take a, um, a practical perspective and says, well, you show me that what's in Australia is working correctly here. And if you can show, get an expert to say, this is just replicated across multiple jurisdictions. So therefore you might get scientific instrument after a few years. I don't know, but there, issues that are going to arise out of this new technology. It could be. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, that's the natural language version. And something If there is a mismatch between what the coder has written in the smart legal contract and what's in the natural language, that's why you need these precedence clauses and say natural language will take precedent over the coder. Right? Now then you've got the issue that if they realize that records have been written, which in accordance with this smart legal contract, 
And that smart legal contract really doesn't match what the, you're going to have to stop that, work out where you're going to go back to, right, and restart. Oh, it's a global issue. That's, um, yeah. So when they rejected the DAOs and said, like, they blocked it back, that was a community issue then for the DAOs to find it. International community. Yeah. Like Look, um, the other aspect, you know, it's in my paper that you're going to get a copy of. Um, I talk about um, Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the anti commons uh, the, the classic example of the tragedy of the anti commons is actually the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council, China can veto, America can veto, Russia can veto, right? Very rarely do they all agree, but they can. The problem with the DAO was, and the reason it took so long, is Vitalik initially wanted to do a soft fork, right? That was his initial reaction. But then he had people in the background telling him, he says, if you don't do something really serious about this, you're going to undermine the trust in the whole of the Ethereum platform. And that's why he wanted that or went to a hard fork. Now, he then had to go all the way back. When did the Jenk brothers in Slocket actually activate that code? And they went to the block immediately before that and then did the hard fork. And then, but... The, they only did the hard fork. The actual person who, and I hate the word hack, he didn't hack the code. He just took advantage of some of the um, poor coding arrangements within the DAO. Um, he still ended up with $8 million, I think, value after the uh, hard fork. I think that might have been Ethereum Yeah, that is Ethereum Classic, yeah. That's right, because you have all these stakeholders who said, I'm, they, they ran the view, code is law. Yeah, yeah they ran code is law. There is a name that will have a, a regular expectation. Yeah. Yes. They lost 160 million on that one, didn't they? It was a massive amount. That's right. <laughs> it's probably a billion bucks now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And he did. And I, well, they did. Could have been a she. That's right. There's a lot of good female coders out there. Yes, sir. Natural language. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the difficulty you've got, you've got a lot of stakeholders. No, the, the big problem is you've got a lot of stakeholders, right? You've got miners, you've got whales, um, you have. Yeah. That's why you need a precedence clause. Yeah. Very straightforward. It is fairly straightforward, but you need to get lawyers to understand all of this stuff. 
very recently used it for the fact that the code was just thrown away. People use it, and then next thing you know, you've got 20 million dollars sitting there, and it turns out to be a fake switch. So they said, yes. we're going to upgrade the contract, upgrade the contract to this world, 20 million dollars, I'll see you later. So, yeah, upgradeability has problems too. Yes. As I said, I don't have all the answers to this stuff. This is a lot of policy issues. Um, I mean, look, let me give you the Bragg report, which is, um, the, uh, sorry, am I, uh, I'm well and truly over. Oh, sorry, uh, never mind. Another time. Thanks for the uh, very interesting uh, talk.